So again, just let me add my, my thanks and, and my welcomes on this, this afternoon. My name is Adam Pearson, and this, as you've heard, is Daniel Bennett, and we also have Adam Junior, our baby. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm 31 years old, here from sunny, sunny Florida, God's country. I am a business graduate from University of Brighton, and we have yet to use, which makes my parents super proud. I went for a job in radio upon graduating, came second, so I didn't get it, so they stuck me in TV just to keep me quiet, and that's worked out rather well for me. I think everything I do has a real thrust on it of, of diversity and inclusion, and getting a more accurate representation of um, disability and disagreement on, on our screens and taking us away from the, the more Channel 5, shoppy ducky side of things. So I'm going to be casting, specialist casting consultant on Channel 4's The Undateables. I presented documentaries such as Adam Pierce the Freak Show, The Ugly Face of Disability Hate Crime, Horizon, My Amazing Twin, and I've even had a mood scene with Miss Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Dagmar Bennett, I'm from South West Wales, best place in the world, obviously. Um, I'm 26, I moved to London when I was 21, where I found my passion on a technical arts course at Wimbledon College of Arts. Um, and this is my degree, where I did um, Adam as my final piece. Um, this degree is partly funded by Madame Tussauds, so we learned how to do figurative sculpture, puppetry, aesthetics, props. It's quite a wide range of skills, which I think skill set is a very important thing in arts. And yeah, we're going to talk about Adam Junior today. So, myself and Dan Mark met on that wonderfully social place that the children call Twitter. She tweeted me saying, hey, I say tweeted, she wrote a word document and took a screenshot of it because she can't write Twitter. But nevertheless, she said, hey, I'm a sculptor, I like to sculpt you for my final project. I get a lot of these very weird, unsolicited tweets and emails to this day. The president of the Herbal Medicinal Society, which is the most drug dealer and job title on earth, um, emails my agent offering to fix me. So I, I replied and said, okay, let's all meet for coffee and have a chat. So we met in Cafe Nero, yeah. again, in Sunny Sunny Croydon. Yeah. And um, two hour conversation. Yeah. Um, so I was looking at facial disfigurement from a sculptor's point of view because I was really interested in the forms of the face. Um, so obviously Adam being as famous that he is, he came up first at the top of Google search and I started to look into the work that he was doing and how he was trying to break down the barriers of how people with a disfigurement are moving within society. So as he said, I tweeted him, we met Ed, and luckily we got on like a house on fire. Have you ever seen a house on fire? It's all weird sentence. Um, we talked from politics to Jeremy Carter, so he's talked about a range of things. Yes. And I knew that it was crucial for me to develop a good relationship with Adam. Um, just because I thought that I could really get into who he was and his character. So a quote is from Grace and Perry and he says the portraits are some of the greatest art in history and they are a scary challenge for any artist. You are a part psychologist and part detective. You come from clues to the inner life and everything you have seems you disturb. One single image is all you get. But get it right, and that image tells you something a thousand selfies never could. So, this really sums up how vital it is to you know, try and get into someone's character. So, I spent summer, um, the whole summer following Adam around. So, I might say stalking. And he introduced me to a lot of charities and organisations, and I took him to modern art and galleries. So, charity wise, we have the Centre for Appearance Research, they do exactly what they say. On the team, my two good friends, Nicola Rumsey and Daniel Harcourt, are two of the best brains in the game when it comes to psychology appearance. We also have Genetic Disorder UK, who most people know through their annual fundraising drive, G2G, so you strap on your jeans to school or work and donate a pound or two pounds or whatever you can afford. That will then come to the charity and gets disseminated in the form of grants to other smaller charities who are supporting the families and children affected by genetic conditions, be that a piece of specialist equipment, a support worker, an excursion for families to meet other families whose children are affected by the same condition. I sit on a panel that help decide where the money goes. It's like a, it's an early emotional episode of, of Dragon's Den and someone normally ends up crying. <laughs> and then Changing Faces are the UK's largest charity that offer support and counselling to people who are affected by facial disfigurement and visible difference. 
It was established in 1992 by my good friend James Partridge, who at the age of 18 was involved in a road traffic accident in South Africa and was rather severely burned. And upon being discharged from hospital several months later, realised there wasn't that much in the way of aftercare for people who were struggling to adjust their, their new appearance and therefore their new lives. So he established changing cases to help fill that void. So my motivation behind doing the piece was the fact that I was highly inspired by Adam's bravery, his determination and his um, positive attitude. So when you're doing a sculpture of someone, it's really good to put about five or six words that you think that sum them up. So when you're doing it, you can always refer back to it. So I thought Adam was someone that's not pretty full, a leader, someone who is brave, someone who is happy, heroic and kind. And obviously, as you can see, he's a bit of a model as well. <laughs> um, so a quote that really sums Adam up is at the bottom here, which is, success in life is not, some, is not rated by the amount of money you make, but by the effect you have on others and what you leave behind for others. I think this is a really good quote to sum up you. So I wanted to use art as a tool to help Adam to break down these barriers and how people would to stay and live within society. Um, the mass media, be that my guys in TV, that was guys in art, your guys in fashion, um, bombard us every day with the with images of, of, of perfection, how we should look. I think subconsciously we take in 3,000 a day. So for every one image of Adam Jr. that myself and Dan can throw out to help educate people, the media get another 2,999 cracks in it. And this can be very um, damaging psychologically. We have a, a dog advert that we'd like to show that illustrates this point rather well. Disfigurement. There are several misconceptions that people have that, are, that, are, um, that have their origins in, in the mass media. This idea of, of sympathy that um, because I have a disfigurement, I'm unhappy, lonely, and unsuccessful. And that my evenings consist of lasagna for one, rarely a head played on a loop, and just hugging the dog and crying. Not only is this, this is completely untrue, I'm not a big rarely head fan, and it's not gonna, it's not going to help. All it's going to do is isolate myself from my friends and family, and it's also going to really piss off my dog, and she bites me very hard, so that's the last thing I want to do. We also have this misconception that it's somehow to be, to be feared, that it's shocking. You really need to look at some Disney, Marvel, and Bond movies to realise where this comes from. Scarf and the Lion King, whose disfigurement is such an intrinsic part of his evil nature that he's named after it. Um, the Joker in, in Batman, that because I have this figurement, I go home at night, sit in a dark room, and plot the destruction of Gotham and the death of Christian Bale. And also the, the Bond films, Alex Trevelyan from Goldeneye, Blofeld from the Internet of Twice, and Harry Bardem from Skyfall, all just prime examples of how this figurement is used almost as a lazy shorthand for evil. The uh, idea also that's here for people's amusement and somehow funny also your entertainment. This again can be seen in, in movies, in 
Channel 5 is shot documentaries. Um, we had one on this week called The Boy With No Brain. That's what you just shown us his brain scan, he's clearly got one. And even further back to the evil billion days of uh, Joseph Merrick and Tom Thumb in the old Victorian freak shows. And finally, we have what, in my opinion, is the most unhelpful one sheer avoidance. The idea that this stigma is wrong on so many levels, it shouldn't be discussed, it should be avoided at all costs. These can have severe psychological impacts for those, those who are affected. Um, there are 540,000 people who are affected by facial disfigurement in the UK alone, which on average works out at about 1 in 144, give or take. And for these, thank you. For these people, um, life can be a day to day challenge, being stared at on public transport, having to tell that the, the invention of social networking has made it even harder for them to escape from it. I know people who are afraid to leave their house and have their shopping delivered. For those of you of a, a Darwinian persuasion, if you go and look at any school playground in the United Kingdom, you'll see this theory being played out in its rawest form. And these are the kind of things that we want to challenge. So we don't just want to stand here and, and moan about it. We want to offer, offer very good and practical solutions. And from my, my experience, inclusion is the, the strongest way forward. Making a conscious effort to include as wide a spectrum of people in, in your work as possible, which is where the mainstream media, whilst it's doing, is making massive strides. I think the, the disabled pound is worth roughly 80 billion, the grey pound 60, and the black pound 100 billion. So it's crucial that these people are seen and represented as much as possible on TV, in art, and in fashion. Definitely. So I guess yourselves as fashion designers or artists, you can try and help put out more diverse images out there. I also read a really good article in a newspaper about a child who was in the park with her mother, who saw a disabled child and who had a facial disfigurement with her mother. So this child, instead of um, this child, sorry, she was asking her mother questions like, what, you know, why does this other child look like this? But the mother instantly shot her child down and didn't answer her questions and she told her off. But in actual fact, you should be encouraging your child to ask questions. You should be encouraging them to answer. And also, there is nothing wrong with curiosity. And when you're at such a young age, it's okay to be curious. And that's the best time to teach them. And also to go and meet the child, you know, make sure that you can introduce one child to another child and explain the whole situation. So obviously, you might think that it's wrong if you're getting <coughs> Absolutely, that kind of curiosity, if, if left unanswered, is what eventually evolves into prejudice at an older age. So, my inspirations, I was looking at um, early on throughout history the idealisations of beauty and also the idealisations of man. So, we can see we've got the Vitruvian man, which I'm sure you all know, and this is all to do with measure. It's a drawing based on the architect's work, um, which is your body. It's all to measure, so your head, for example, your head should fit into the height of your body 10 times, and your arms, when you're out stretched, they should be exactly the same as the height of the body. So we can see this as an idealisation of how humans are expected to be, or how we should be. We've also got the Canon sculpture from um, one of the Greek sculptors, and this is um, a sculpture, because the Greeks believed highly that beauty was to do with good and just. So you can see this in measure, in proportions, and in symmetry. The, the idea that beauty is associated with good and justice is psychologically called the halo effect. If you look at someone like Cheryl Cole, we, we all seem to have forgot, forgotten that she's got a racial assault charge against her, and just think she's kind of good, beautiful, and the nation's sweetheart. It's also a very interesting inversion of today's culture. Nowadays, we want to feel crap about ourselves, we can look down towards our phones, whereas in ancient Greece you can look up at statues. So here we have William Hunter, who's one of the Hunter brothers. Um, they were both anatomists. They've got the Hunter Museum in London, which is well worth checking out. Um, and he believed in something called the mark of the truth, which is when you show something exactly as it is. So that's why I chose to do Adam in a hyper-realistic style, in Adam Jr. So I wanted to not um, sensationalise him, as many media images may do to people that have got some sort of physical difference. 
when we talk sensationalising, it's often done in very um, Daily Mail and the Sun, other newspapers are available, headlines are hideously disfigured, tragically disfigured, and these negative buzzwords only force to reinforce the already existing negative perceptions that exists. Disfigurement is also the only minority group that this, this is done with, unless you're Donald Trump. You never see things like tragically Mexican, hideously gay, or unfortunately female in, in the headlines. So here's some more images of artworks that I used to do, and these ones are celebrated in differences. So we've got the old man and his grandson, which I absolutely love this piece of the grandfather, he's got a visible difference, but we can also see as the viewer that the child is looking at with nothing but unconditional love and it's just a lot of strength between them. We've also got the grotesque woman, which is the second image, and this woman has got Paget's disease, which is a malformation of the bones, but as you can see, she's got a flower, she's a very embellished dress, and she is looking for love, so she's obviously feeling very beautiful. And this is I'd, get, I'd say that she's um, being celebrated a little bit, more intriguing by her condition. We've also got a sculpture by Mark Quinn, um, Alison Lapper, pregnant. I'm not sure if any of you saw that on the fourth plinth in 2005. So this is obviously a very public place. And Alison Lapper is an amazing artist in her own right. And she's got thalidomide, so it means you have no arms and no legs. But she's had a child and had a son, and she brought up this child. So obviously she's a very courageous woman. And this is just an amazing place for her to be shown in public view. So the inspiration for the poses, I wanted to show Adam the supplement, very heroic. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me, in the back. But I wanted to a very classical heroic poses to have your right shoulder forwards, your left shoulder back, and then you look slightly above. So this is a very heroic pose that you're looking forwards to the future with a lot of determination. I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of how I made Adam Jr. Um, so I started off, I took Adam to Madame Tussauds studio in London and we went there and we took measurements of his face, first of all. So this is the, you um, put, point out areas of the face which are your bone structure, you use eyeliner. So for example, from the tragus, which is the lobe in the middle of your ear to the forehead. You take that measurement and then you put it down on a piece of paper and you collect all your measurements. So when you're doing a sculpture, the idea is that you can cross-reference all of these measurements and then you get a 3D form. We also took reference images, which I've got about 100 <laughs> reference images here. Um, to get the most accurate image of someone, you have to be five to six metres from them standing. And we took images from all different angles, from above, from below. And it's quite funny because Adam used to come into the studio and I just used to have all of these images. I used to be listening to him on my headphones. <laughs> I used to be drawing him, I used to be sculpting him, so it's a little bit, a little bit. Sure, it's here with a Yeah. <laughs> but my teacher, Alan Sly, big man, um, he was very adamant that I would use photographs and not cast because this way you're turning something that's a flat into a 3D form, which is a really useful technique and skill to have. So, <laughs> um, so they use a substance called alginate, which when it's when it's cool is, is a liquid form. So they slap it all over you to get a, a impression, and then they wrap that in plaster of Paris, so you can only breathe through your nose. And it, the whole process takes about fifteen to twenty minutes, and it, it's the closest experience of being buried alive one can have without actually being buried alive. But I, I was very much at this point in for a penny, in yeah. for a pound. So, you go, you throw yourself into it, and you roll it. Yeah. Fair play to Adam, he's been giving me a lot of this time and energy, so thank you for that. But, um, pass can be slightly distorted as well because the weights can fall down, so it's, it's also not a very good thing to work from them. So, I began by doing the armchair, which is welding bits of metal together, and you get a rough measurement from the top to around here, and then from the whips. So when you're sculpting, it's very important to start off with the structure, which is a skeleton, like building a house really. Um, so you start off with the skeleton, and then you build up with the muscles, and then the skin on top of that. So it's, if, it's as if you're building a human form itself. So we use something called the chief line in sculpture, which is your central line. So this is where you'd have it, 
you'd see, obviously if you're using a tape measure or a ruler, you wouldn't be able to get an accurate, um, accurate straight line. So this has got a weight on the bottom of it. So you hang it, and this falls exactly in a straight line. So if I wanted his pose to be slightly forward as he's standing, this line should be going through the eye and through the middle of his chest. So when you're sculpting, you look at this, and you see how much clay is on either side. Great one. <laughs> Another example of a skeleton are the clavicles, which is your collarbone. So your collarbone sits on top of your ribs, and it joins with your shoulder blades. Um, so this starts here at the beginning. Don't they? Should I open your top now? <laughs> <laughs> An excuse. <laughs> so it starts here. As you can see, Adams isn't very, it doesn't point out that his nose is like mine, quite, they come out quite a lot, don't they? But they're not actually a straight line. Your clavicles are like a bow and arrow, so they start out here and then they go inwards. So when you're sculpting, you mark these points, so you get a screw, and then you mark the top point here, where this comes out, mine's quite high, and you mark that, and then you also mark your supersternal notch, which is here, which is this little pit in between your clavicles, and you also mark your seventh cervical, which is your top, top, top of your um, spine. So when you um, start off, you mark these, and then you always have that, that layer in position. So then the muscles, we've got John Travolta, Adam here. That's what they're doing all the way around, it's the rest of <laughs> So when you're doing the muscles, I actually got Adam quite wrong. I had to chop off his arms. So at this stage, you have to really trust your eye, because as a sculptor and an artist, your eye is your most valuable tool. So I had to stand away from the sculpture, and get my tools, which are like this, the wooden tools, and like this, all the different sizes. You'd mark the clay and you'd have to be really confident and trust your eye and trust yourself and you'd mark where you think that it had gone wrong, you'd take it off and then you'd add to it. So this is a kidney, which is one of the very good sculpting tools to get um, forms right at the beginning. So you can see it moves the clay around to where you want it to be. And then you have this, which is one of the larger sculpting tools, and they go down to as small as this that. And they're made out of boxwood, it's a very flexible um, wood. And then, yeah, you sculpt away. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when doing the face, you start off again with the skull, and to get this um, shape, you go from the back of the head to the forehead, from the crown to the chin, and then from the trays to the pravis. So this gives you the overall shape of the head. You then start going in and doing the forms again, but it's always important Say if I was doing Adam's eye, I'd relate it to where um, the edge of his mouth um, ends, and then also the bottom of his nose, I'd relate it to where the bottom of the ears are. So you're constantly relating one feature to the next. Otherwise, you'd be so concentrated on one area, it wouldn't be the full form altogether. So as you can see in the images, all of the form is starting to flow nicely, and it's all coming into shape. Then, I don't know if you know Ron Mirk, check him out, he's an artist as well, check him out. Um, he does hyper-realistic, large-scale pieces, um, he used to work in the film industry, and he does amazing skin colour and amazing texture. So, the best, my best tool was a bit of see-through plastic, and then also a nail, and I'd literally just be poking in really slowly all of the texture, and then I'd get the nail and I'd go scrape in some lines. Not that you've got any windfalls. <laughs> and then you'd smudge it a little bit and then you'd go over it again. So obviously your skin's got many different layers. So then the moulding process, which is a two-part silicon mould. So you apply this to the front and the back and then do a fiberglass jacket. Um, and this, for those of you who don't know, is to do with chemicals and you can, the ear temperature can affect it, so it's an art form in itself. And then you rip away the sculpture <laughs> So it gets hammered, the clay actually gets hammered and you're left with the, the silicon mould. And then I pass in resin fiberglass. So <laughs> um, you, have, you do it in the fiberglass and then you have the two sides, you have the front and the back, and you put them together, then you have the seam, the seam line. So when you get to this stage, you, you definitely have a seam line, but it's important to get rid of this line because obviously you don't want to see where it joins and you just really, really work your sculpture at this stage. 
So the here, this is where I got to spend hours on the weekend poking in one here individually. So at this stage, you look closely at which direction the hair grows in. So you see on his, um, around the hairline and his eyebrows. So the idea is, is that you punch in the hair the same way that it grows in. So it takes about three to four weeks to do a full head of hair, but I was on a few time constraints, so I just did the eyebrows and the hairline. I just did a week. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> And the colouring, the final stage, um, this is quite a delicate stage, so Adam would come in quite a lot at this stage and I'd look at his face and compare him to um, foundations. And also i compare him in real life to the, photo, the reference images that I have, because obviously each image is, they have different colourations to them. At this stage you use all different colours, oil paints, from blues to reds to oranges to yellows, so you'd flick it on with a brush, you'd never ever touch the actual sculpture, you'd just flick it slowly but surely. So you'd come in one morning, you'd do a few layers, you'd wait for it to dry and then you'd come in the next day or that evening and then you'd apply another layer. So if Adam had looked like he'd been in a river for two weeks, he was too blue and too cold, you'd bring him back to the warmer shades of the colours. Yeah, that was the process of how I made him. So, um, what have you been up to since? Um, well, I've, been, I've been hanging out with you and, and Adam and Jimmy here. Um, <laughs> Dad, we got past today. I've done a, a, a few, a few doc documentaries, writing me obligatory, just saying one guy book. I've been writing a TED talk that I've got to give at the end of this month. And then another one to start next year now. Um, things have been, been slowly, slowly ticking up. What about you? Um, this Adam Jr. has toured a few exhibitions. Um, the most high profile one was the Society of Portrait Sculptors, which is in central London, um, well worth checking out. And what else did we do? I went to the Centre for Research and Appearance, which we mentioned earlier. We went to the Appearance Matters Conference, which is where I met Caroline, which, if you're into the psychology of appearance, it's really an amazing three days. You have doctors, um, psychologists, artists, all types of people coming and collecting information about the psychology of appearance. So yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's us. If anyone's got any, any questions, we'll happily answer them. If you want to hang out afterwards and yeah. take selfies or buy us coffee, that's <laughs> also <laughs> yeah. all sort of thing. Buy me some lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but come and have a look at everything that's on the table as well. Yeah. Well, thank you very much.